Well, good morning, Rocky Peak. Great to see you. Uh, my name is Michael, and I'm one of the pastors here. And this is your very first time. I just want to welcome you. Uh, personally, glad that you're here with us. We're going to go into our time of teaching right now. Maybe you're joining us from the Ridge venue, but uh, inside uh, our program is a green and white message note sheet we use every week. And so if you're new, you may not know that one. Definitely want to take that out. And if you guys are ready to jump in, I'm ready to get going. You ready to go? Yeah. All right, let's pray. God, we're just excited to be here. We're excited what you're doing in our church. And week by week, as you're um, kind of unpacking like, layer by layer, what it looks like to be transformed, what it looks like to live a life of love, what the kind of transformation needs to happen inside us to create that kind of capacity, the way we go about it. We just thank you so much for what we're learning and what you're doing. And Father, as always, we just acknowledge that all teaching, um, all insight, um, all revelation comes from your Holy Spirit, that without you, we cannot see what we need to see Without you, we don't have the power to change it. So we just come as your children. We acknowledge that. We pray you'd open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word that might be transforming in our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Well, our story starts today in a, in a large church. Uh, and the, it's a large church in a larger city. And uh, rumors are starting to go around the church, and everyone who hears the rumors can't believe it, because these two men, these two leaders that have been part of the top leadership tier of their church uh, have been such an effective kind of dynamic duo. I mean, they've been a powerful team. Um, they are gifted leaders or gifted teachers, um, and they have been close friends for a long time, and God has used them in an amazing way. But uh, rumor has it that they are going to be kind of splitting up their partnership and they're going to be heading different directions. And, and no one can believe it. Um, those closest to them who know them personally know that this, uh, this kind of break in their relationship, their partnership, it's not, it's not like a long-term conflict. It's not like there's this kind of been hostility or issues building up over the years that it really is more about a single issue that they just can't seem to come to see kind of eye to eye on. And uh, those closest to them, that as, as they've discussed this issue with them, they can see it both ways. It's not like it's one way or another. It, they can see both sides. It's just hard to believe these two gifted leaders who love Jesus, uh, so wise, uh, so many gifts, so much maturity, that they can somehow work their way through to a solution. And, uh, and so it's the night before, um, and these two men, after all their talk, all their conversation, all their prayer, their debate, they're working it through, they've come to a decision. And uh, tomorrow morning, they're going to be sharing with their church the decision that the rumor is no longer a rumor, the rumor has become a reality, and they're splitting up, heading different directions. Well, today, we are continuing this series that we've been in for the last six weeks. It's called Loving People, Doing Relationships a Whole New Way. And if you're new, I not only want to welcome you, but um, also just to kind of a quick recap, Th this is a series about relationships. And what we've seen in this series is that for, for followers of Jesus, if you're considering being a follower of Jesus, for those of us who've made that decision to follow Jesus, that Jesus was very clear. There's two top priorities in our life. And the top priority is we would love God with all we have. We love him with all our heart, our soul, all our mind, our strength. That, that the way I like to put it is that knowing him, that loving him, that pleasing him would be our top priority in life. And then out of that flows a second priority, Jesus said, because this is what matters most to God, is that we would love others as we love ourselves, or as Jesus would later say, that we would love one another as he has loved us. But what we've seen is that even after we come to Jesus, we have this new kind of uh, power of the Holy Spirit, we have this new love for God, a new love for people, that often when it comes to our relationships with others, we kind of tend to naturally fall back into our old patterns, our old habits, our old, the models that we've seen. And so instead of kind of learning how to live out a life of love, we, we kind of, uh, we just kind of fall back the, on what we know. 
And so we're often not sure how to do that in everyday life. And so what we're doing in this series is kind of going back to say, uh, going back to the word, like what does the word teach us about how to live a life of love, do relationships a whole new way, the Jesus way. So today, topic on the table is conflict, uh, path to growth. And honestly, this is one of my favorite topics in this series, uh, not because I love conflict, but because as, as you look at relationships, you look at living out a life of love, there are very few topics that are more important because if we don't learn how to move towards love in a way that leads to growth and intimacy, uh, it can destroy our relationships. So it's just so incredibly important. If we're serious about following Jesus, living out a life of love, we need how to learn how to do conflict in a whole new way. And so the way I want to get at this today is I want to start with five big picture principles about conflict, how conflict works how the word looks at conflict, what we should expect, the approach we should take to it, uh, and then come back at the end and get as, as uh, specific and practical as I can. If let's say you're in a conflict situation right now or you're coming into one uh, in the future, how do you approach that in a Jesus way to live out a life of love uh, in times of conflict? So there on your note sheet, you have a section called Conflict, the Path to Growth, and we've got five kind of big picture principles. So let's jump in. The first one is just very simple. It goes like this. The conflict is normal, all right? So that, that notice, when you look at relationships, the only kinds of relationships that don't eventually have conflict are either relationships that are very superficial or the relationships that are very dishonest. Because often in relationships, um, uh, if we choose not to deal with conflict issues, we can, we can choose not to have that conflict. Um, but all that means is that there are serious issues that are threatening the life of that relationship that we're not dealing with. But uh, the reality is, as we're going to see today, is that uh, conflict is an opportunity. And that, uh, that conflict is not only normal, but that uh, if we approach conflict in the right way, it can actually lead to a new level of growth and intimacy in the relationship. Uh, many years ago in my previous life when I was at another church, uh, uh, I went to a men's retreat, and there was a speaker there. We had him, we had him in for our, our men, and uh, he was uh, kind of a he was uh, kind of a high level uh, Christian counselor back in the Midwest, and his name was Gary Oliver. But he said something at this retreat that uh, I wrote down, never forgot. Put it there on your note sheet. He said, "Conflict is the process that we go through, and the price we pay for intimacy." Now I want you to think about that. The question is, do you want to have close relationships? Do you want to have healthy relationships? Do you, want to, do you want to build deep and authentic relationships in your life? What he says is that you can do that, but there's a price to pay. There's a price of admission. And the price of admission for deep, uh, meaningful, uh, authentic relationships is that we have to learn how to do conflict well. We have to learn how to process through conflict. Uh, this week, we're reading, uh, uh, in our life group study, we're reading a selection from the uh, Cloud and Townsend's book, How to Have That Difficult Conversation. This is the way they put it. Uh, the extent to which two people in a relationship can bring up and resolve issues is a critical marker of the soundness of their relationship. In other words, like, so if you're in a relationship, how do you measure how healthy that relationship is? One of the best markers is can you bring up hot button topics and can you work through those and resolve those in a healthy way? If you can, uh, chances are it's a great relationship. If you can't, we'll have problems. Because what happens in any relationship, let's say, well, it's a marriage, it's a friendship, it's a ministry team, it's a life group, it's a business group. It doesn't really matter. Any group where there are significant issues that you can't really bring up, you can't process, you can't resolve, that puts like a glass ceiling on that relationship. In other words, hey, we can't talk about this, and we can't talk about this, and we can't talk about this. So what it does is you can't bring your true self to the relationship. You have to pretend to be someone you're not. I can only share this much of me because if I were to share what I really think about this issue, we would have conflict, that would blow up, we can't handle that, so I have to pretend to be someone that I'm not. 
But if we're able to move through, move towards conflict, able to work through process, resolve it, what happens, it takes the relationship to a d- deeper level because with every passing conflict, we are learning each other better and we are learning that I can trust you, this is a safe relationship, we can process things together. So conflict is normal, it can lead to growth, uh, and the New Testament assumes this. It's interesting because often in Christian circles, I think we can be surprised by conflict. Uh, often in Christian circles, you, we're surprised when we have conflict with someone in the church or someone in our life group or a ministry team. Hey, this is church, shouldn't we all be getting along here? And so it can even throw us off our game. Maybe I should get out of this life group, or maybe I should need to leave this ministry team, or this is not the right church for me. But what the New Testament assumes that in the body of Christ, as followers of Jesus, we're going to have conflict. And that conflict's going to come for a couple different reasons. Some are just totally neutral reasons. You and I are just, we're different people, different life experiences, different spiritual gifts, different, uh, different perspectives, different personalities. Those things lead to, to conflict, just naturally, nothing wrong with that. But then on top of that, we're all part of a fallen human race. We all have a fallen human nature with its magnetic pull towards conflict. It's interesting, this week in our life group study, one of the passages we looked at, uh, uh, if you haven't got there, you're going to look at, is Galatians chapter 5, where Paul talks about uh, fallen human nature. And in chapter 5, in verse uh, 19 and 20, there in your note sheet, he says, the acts of the flesh, in other words, our fallen human nature. So the acts of our flesh, and he lists some of the norms you'd expect to start with, like sexual morality and purity, but then as he goes down the list, they become very relational. And he says the acts of the flesh are obvious, and then as we move down the list, he says hatred, discord, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, right? This is why, like, when you're working out at a gym or you're at a restaurant or Starbucks, How many times do you overhear a conversation, because people are talking too loud, but how many times do you hear someone saying like, this is just the greatest person in the world and I can't, like how many times instead do you hear someone complaining about someone, complaining about their spouse, complaining about the situation, complaining about, you hear it all the time. Why? Because this is our natural fall in human nature. So the Bible, uh, it assumes that even as followers of Jesus come to Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit, there, we are going to have conflict with one another, and that's why there are so many passages in the Bible, or in the New Testament, we've been looking at them throughout this series, that talk about bearing with one another, that talk about forgiving one another, that talk about being patient with one another. Why are they there? Because the New Testament is assuming that we are going to have conflict. And you know, this conflict can happen at any level of a church or a Christian community or ministry. Uh, let me give you an example, even at the highest levels. Like, let me give you an example. To, uh, today we started the day with a story, right? The story of a large church, large city. You thought it was Miami, but it's not. It's, uh, this is a story that comes out of the life of the early church Uh, And the life of the early church at the city of Antioch, which was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. And uh, in the church at Antioch, two of the top leaders, think of like a ministry team here, like we would have teaching pastors here, uh, that two of the top leaders of that uh, church were, uh, some we're very familiar with, the Apostle Paul, and then uh, one of his close ministry partners and friends associates, a man named Barnabas. And they had already gone out on, at this point in their life, they had already gone out and shared Jesus in what I like to call uh, their first Jesus sharing expedition, right? It's traditionally called Paul's mission, first missionary tour. So uh, they've gone out, they had shared Jesus, they had risked their lives, they had started an amazing team. They came back. Later on, Paul says to Barnabas, hey, why don't we go back? Well, let's visit some of those churches we started. Barnabas says, great, let's take my cousin, John Mark. And Paul says, no, I don't think so. Uh, And so it turns out that John Mark had gone with them as their assistant on their first Jesus sharing expedition, and he bailed on them. Now, it was a very dangerous mission. I mean, Paul got stoned in Lystra, right? The the old-fashioned way, (laughs) yeah. Uh, But uh, he'd gotten stoned in Lystra. You're thinking like, yeah, that's pretty heavy. You got to pull him out of that bar. It's weird, but no, uh, he, he, 
he had gotten, he'd got, I mean, it was a very dangerous journey. And midway, John Mark had bailed on them. He had deserted on them. And so Paul's like, I don't, I want to have people I can trust and rely on. And Barnabas is going, yeah, but he's my cousin. Right? And so I want to give him a second chance. You can see it from both sides. Uh, and this conflict is a big conflict. In fact, there in your note sheet in uh, Acts 15, this is how Luke describes it. He said, Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul didn't think it was wise to take them because he deserted them on their first trip in the region of Pamphylia, and he not continued with them. He kind of, you know, he, he kind of flamed out. And so they, they had such a sharp disagreement, and in the Greek's very strong language, uh, such a sharp disagreement, they parted company. Now, and I'm reading this, I'm going, are you kidding me? Paul and Barnabas go way back. When Paul came to Jesus and everyone was scared to death of him because he had been persecuting the church, it was Barnabas that said, no, the guy's for real, trust him. Uh, when Paul went to, back to Tarsus where he'd grown up, it was Barnabas who got him to come to Antioch. We could really use your help here. They had traveled this first missionary journey, risked their lives together. God had used him in an amazing way. Would not you think that these two amazing leaders, gifted men, gifted by the Holy Spirit, mature Christ followers, would you not think that they could listen and follow and get on the same page? Like, don't you, like, hey, God, we're just praying about, and so I don't know why they couldn't, but the reality is they couldn't. And this is what I want you to catch, is that in the body of Christ, uh, whether it's our families, our life groups, our churches, our ministry, conflict is normal. It's why there's so much scripture on it. And so the key to living a life of love, like the key to maturity, the sign of maturity is not that you don't have conflict. The sign of maturity is you know how to work through conflict in a way that, catch this, resolves the issue and protects the relationship, all right? So conflict is, is normal. Now, number two. Number two is that unresolved conflict is not an option. And this is what the New Testament says. Now, let me say this real quick, 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 quick uh, neon light sidebar. I get this, that there are some people that are impossible, and there are some situations you cannot resolve. We're gonna talk about that later on, right? Um, and so I get that. Um, but but what, the, what Jesus would say, what the New Testament would say, is as a follower of Jesus, that living with unresolved conflict, to the extent it depends on you, uh, it's, it's uh, not an option. Now, Jesus was very clear on this. Uh, for example, this week in our life group study, we looked at a passage, and I pointed this out in the curriculum, in the, in the study, it's an important fact that we often miss, is that Jesus was doing his teaching um, in this passage in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Jesus was doing his teaching in the north of the country near the Sea of Galilee. So uh, from the Sea of Galilee down to Jerusalem, which is where the temple was. And remember, there's only one temple. In, like if you do sacrifice, you can't do sacrifice at a synagogue. You have to do a temple. And so there's only one, and it's approximately 85 miles from uh, the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, to uh, Jerusalem. So it's going to take you walking at least four days, maybe seven days, four to seven days probably. It's a long journey. So to go to the temple was a big deal. It would take you a week to get there and a week to get back. Now, when you get there, when you think temple, remember, don't think Rocky Peak. Don't think church. Right? Think fortress. The, the, the temple complex was massive. When we go to Israel, we go underground to see um, some of the stones of the foundation of the temple complex. One of those stones weighs 600 tons. It's like 30 feet long, eight feet uh, tall, and seven feet wide. I mean, it's just, I mean, this place is massive. It's three football fields wide. 
It's five football fields long. It can hold 100,000 people inside the complex. It's all stone fortress. When Rome came to attack the temple complex and attack Jerusalem, it took four years to break through. I mean, this is incredible. So when you go to the temple, it's a big deal. And when you go to the temple, you go up through a series of steps and getting closer and closer as you're moving up to the, to the, uh, to, you know, to the actual the sacrifice are. And when you go to offer the temple, you just can't take any animal. You have to get a certified animal or your animal has to be certified. It's got to be, you know, rabbi approved. Get the stamp on, on that goat, you know, this goat passes the test. And then when you get up there, there's going to be a lot of priests operating, and there, there's all these different places for the slaughter of animals and where the blood runs out. And I mean, this is a big production. So to go to the temple to offer a sacrifice is a big deal. And so now Jesus, I want you to put it, he's teaching in Galilee the Sermon on the Mount. And he's going to give an illustration of how important it is to work through conflict. And this is what he says in Matthew chapter 5. He says, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, you've made a week-long journey, you've got your animal, you're up there, you've waited in line, you've got your number, your number 542 for the day. You get up to the priest, you're ready to present your offering, and, th- and all of a sudden you remember your brother has something against you. Now, he's not talking about your physical brother, your brother Jew, right? So this, it's a, is it possible this person had traveled with you from Galilee? Well, sure. He may be local. Hey, but is it possible that he's way back in Galilee? That Shimon the baker is upset with you? Yes, it is possible. And so Jesus says, so if you travel a week down to Jerusalem, you get your certified animal, you're up and ready to go, you're number 542, you've waited in line, and all of a sudden, why couldn't you think of this 10 minutes later? All of a sudden, it's like, oh, Shimon is ticked at me. Jesus says, I want you to leave your gift there. Hey, Joe, can you hold my goat? I'll be back in two weeks. (laughs) Here's 14 shackles to feed him. He says, leave your gift there in front of the altar and first go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. In other words, don't come to relate to God until your relationship is right with your brother. In other words, God cares more about your relationship than your sacrifice, which is saying a lot. In other words, it's impossible to be right with God and wrong with my brother. To the extent it depends on me. Right? And so Jesus was so clear in his teaching, and as John Orberg pointed out in his book, it doesn't really matter whether I'm upset with you or you're upset with me. Either way, I'm to go and try to reconcile this relationship. Now, number three, the third principle is, is that moving towards conflict is counterintuitive. In other words, for the vast majority, there may be a few of us, psychopaths included, um, who love conflict here. We just run to, oh, this is awesome. This is kind of, I get a chance to go deeper in our relationship. This is fantastic, you know. Or I just am so excited I get to tell you off, you know, that, that great conflict. I've been really angry. I'm looking for an opportunity, someone to take it. You're the person. There may be some of us here like that, but usually the vast majority are not like that. For the vast majority, like conflict, uh, moving towards conflict is counterintuitive. That as fallen human beings, we don't move towards conflict to resolve it. We do do everything except moving towards it. Like, let me give you some examples. Here's what we naturally tend to do. This is who we are as fallen human beings, right? We come to Jesus. We still do our relationship the same old way. Chances are you do conflict in a very similar way today as before you came to Jesus. That number one, we pretend. We pretend there's not an issue. Number two, we know there's an issue, but we ignore it. Uh, Number three, we not only ignore it, we hope it will get better on its own. And number four, we talk to others about it. Like, I'm upset with John, so I talk to George. And uh, if I want to feel spiritual, I'll say, I need some prayer. As I describe uh, John and what an idiot he is, uh, in Jesus' name, you know, uh, 
I won't use the word uh, idiot, I'll talk about it. He's just spiritually still learning and growing. Um, and I can't believe this is the 14th time. And so we tend to talk to others. Why? Because we have this issue and we need to get it out there, but we don't want to go to the person and get it out there. So we need to like, it needs to go somewhere. So it tends to go to others. Uh, or another thing that we'll do is withdraw. We have a conflict and so we just drop out of that life group. Then I have to deal with that. Um, I just stopped that ministry. T- I feel led no longer to serve in first impressions. All right, I'm going to go to second impressions. Um, uh, so uh, I love what uh, John Ortberg, will look at him several times today because we're doing this as a life group study, but uh, what he says, he says, dealing with conflict always involves a series of choices, and with each choice, our natural inclination, and that's what I want you to catch, or what comes natural to us, uh, is to handle the conflict in a destructive manner. And this is why I want you to catch as fallen human beings, it's not natural for us to do the right thing when it comes to conflict. And so when we come to, well, I want to put neon lights around this because as followers, if we want to live a life of love, this means that we have to learn to listen and follow the Spirit and do what is counterintuitive, what doesn't come naturally. Now, as we do that over time, it will feel natural. But just like when you're learning anything new, um, like if you break your right, if you're right-handed, you break your right arm, you have to learn to write with your left hand. It's going to feel very awkward at first. We're going to have to be very intentional. Number four, the fourth principle is that conflict can either build up or tear down. That conflict has the ability, uh, has the potential of either building our relationship up, strengthening us, or destroying it. Now, most of us have experienced the destruction part of it. Um, I don't know about you, but if you're like me, it's like most of us are not excited when we have uh, a conflict opportunity. Like most of us are not, this is so awesome. I've been wanting to get close to this person, and I've been praying that God would deepen our relationship. This is fantastic. We now have an issue. And I can approach this, and this will take us to a whole new level. Like most of us are not like, because what we've seen in our past is that conflict is usually destructive, right? We, we, what our experience is, it will usually lead to, to fighting, or uh, someone gets mad, or it will lead to a breakup of the relationship, which is why we often run from it. But the point is, is that what we're going to see is that conflict actually is an opportunity to take the relationship to a deeper level, or if we do it poorly, it can destroy it. Uh, John Maxwell writes, he says, the interesting observation that I have made personally and pastorally, pastorally about relationships is that the level of relationship will be determined by the way those involved respond to conflict. You catch that? The level of our relationship um, will depend on how we respond to conflict. So let me, let me just illustrate. Let's, let's talk about how this works in a marriage. Right? Uh, it'd be the same in a dating relationship. It'd be the same in a friendship. It'd be the same in a business, a ministry, in a life group. But when, when conflict happens, we basically have a couple choices. We can move towards it or move away from it. If we move away from it, like let's say that a couple has conflict over the wife's mother, all right? Now, not that this would ever happen, <laughs> but just as a random illustration. Just use your imagination. Um, that if this couple cannot talk, let's say that the mother is, mother-in-law is overbearing and the mother-in-law is always trying to insert herself into the relationship, and, um, and so this is coming between the husband and wife, and this is the issue of how to deal with the mother, and understandably, the daughter doesn't want to offend her mother, but uh, understandably, the husband doesn't want the mother in the middle of their relationship, and so you can see, you know, you can see both sides of what they're trying to do, but is it, so what happens, let's say that conflict happens, um, if that couple can work through that in a positive way, um, that wife is going to have to share at a very deep level, maybe about her love for her mother, maybe about her desire not to offend her mother, maybe about some insecurity 
her whole life about her mother controlling her life in ways that have been inappropriate. She's never had the courage to put her foot down. Um, there's a whole bunch of issues that the wife may need to share as they process that through together about her, who she is. And the husband may have to work through some uh, issues in his life and share his frustration, his fears, um, the, uh, what's going on on his side. And so uh, if they can do this well, they're going to learn each other in the process. And let's just say that the, the wife has never been able to have the courage to just say no to her mom. And as she's lived under her mom's shadow and, that, and through her husband listening carefully and supporting her and hearing her, the wife finds the courage to, in a respectful way, set boundaries. That that, can you imagine how much life that's going to bring that relationship? That that wife for the first time feels really truly understood. Someone's processed with her and loved her been patient with her, and now helping her to do what she's always wanted to do. Can you see how that will take the relationship to a whole new level between them? But let's say on the other hand, they can't do that. They can't have those conversation. And so what happens is over the first seven years of their marriage, every time this comes up, this leads to a blow up and him sleeping on the couch. What happens over time is they just don't talk about that. So the wife doesn't talk about her inner world. The husband doesn't talk about his inner world. Now just take that one illustration and magnify it. Let's say, let's magnify that. Let's talk about uh, other frustrations in their marriage. Maybe the way they raise children or the way they handle finances or their sexual life. And you start multiplying that out. And what you have, you're 15 years into the marriage, you are, have a marriage where a couple is married. They can't talk about mom. They can't talk about vacations, whether they bring mom along. They can't talk about their finances. They can't talk about their sex life. They can't talk about raising the kids. And so what happens is they learn to back off and live a very shallow, superficial life and relationship. And by the time that couple's 50 years in, if they last that long, the depth of their conversation is, would you pass the salt? Have you ever been to a restaurant and seen an old couple? They just sit there in their own worlds, not talking the whole dinner. And you wonder what happened. Can I tell you something? They did not start their relationship like that. They started very much in love and could not wait to be together. But over time, they have learned, I can't talk about this, you can't talk about this, you can't talk. So are you with me here? What happens is in a relationship that when there's conflict, you can either move towards it and deepen the relationship or you can move away from it, ignore it, pretend it doesn't help. And what that does, it builds up a wall between you that destroys, and it doesn't matter whether it's a marriage, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a work relationship, it's a ministry team, a life group, that the way you deal with conflict will determine the level of growth and intimacy in that relationship. So let's go back and see what John says. So he says, let's just start at the beginning. The interesting observation I have made personally and pastorally about relationships is that the level of the relationship will be determined by the way those involved respond to conflict. I really believe that. When a conflict is not dealt with properly, the relationship can regress to a previous level, but when it occurs and the response is in the right manner, then the relationship can progress to a higher level. So it's the response to conflict that usually determines if the relationship gets better or it begins to disintegrate. Look at the next quote from John Gottman. John is probably the, the top researcher on marriage in the world. That amazing research, why marriages work, why they don't work. And look what he says. If there's one lesson I've learned from my years of research, it is that a lasting marriage results from a couple's ability to resolve conflicts that are in inevitable in any relationship. All right, so... So when we enter a conflict situation, it can be destructive, it can be constructive, it can build up, it can tear down. It has to do with how we respond. Number five, the last principle 
big picture principle before we start getting practical is that uh, conflict is challenging. That conflict is very hard to do well. So if you're here today and you feel like this feels a little bit overwhelming, I'm not sure I'm up to this. I don't know how to do this. I'm not sure I have the courage to move forward. That sounds too scary to me. I've had, I, I, I don't have the ability to do that. I want to tell you, you're in good company. I think that we all feel like that at times. That this is, this is not an easy thing to do. Uh, learning to move towards conflict in a positive way is not an easy thing to do. But what I want you to catch is that as followers of Jesus, if we want to love others well, it's a non-negotiable. We just cannot, we cannot ignore it. And the good news is as followers of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit. He will lead us. If we will listen, if we will follow, the Holy Spirit will train us. He'll teach us how to do this and empower us, give us the courage to step out of the boat into the danger and, uh, and to seek resolution. All right, so what I want to do now is just get as practical as I can. And let's just say that you're in a relationship. And even as I've talked right now, there's someone in your life. There's someone in a life group. Maybe it's in your marriage. Um, maybe uh, there's a ministry team. But there's someone, it's a relative that you've had conflict with. It's unresolved. And you're saying, okay, so if I were to do this, how would I do it? So I want to give you what I'm calling uh, how to, uh, seven steps to having what I call a clarifying conversation. Now, these seven steps are going to sound very orderly. In real life, they'll get mixed up a little bit sometimes, but we'll talk about that as we go. But let's just talk about how, how do you do this. Let's say that you need to have a conversation with someone. Uh, Jesus says, go to them. Uh, go to Shimon the baker. So how do you do this? How do you, how, do you, uh, how do you practically do it? Number one, the first thing is we need to start with a new paradigm. In other words, we need to learn how to look at conflict through a new lens. That often when we think about conflict, the first word that comes to mind is confrontation. So we start with a paradigm of confrontation. And I don't know about you, but when I hear the word confrontation, I think of clash. I think of manning up. I think of getting my armor on. I, I think of getting my arguments ready. Um, I need to be ready. I'm not going to let them push me around, whatever. It, I think of a battle of wills. We are, I'm going to confront this person. And I think that when we think of it that way, there's no, no wonder that we don't want to have those kinds of conversations. And so what I'm suggesting is we need a new paradigm. And we move from a paradigm of confrontation to a paradigm of clarification. And so I want to talk to you today about how to have what I, what I like to call a clarifying conversation. And I hope this language uh, catches on. I mean, it's not the first time I've taught it here at Rocky Peak, but it's been a while. But I hope this catches on because I think that, that language is important. And sometimes just even having the right words to talk about something is very helpful um, and so let's talk about what a clarifying conversation looks like. A clarifying, when we have a clarifying conversation, uh, and I, I'm, coming to, I'm not coming to confront you. What I'm coming to is I'm, I'm looking at, hey, there's something going on in our relationship. There's something that's happened, something you've said, something's, ha something's gone on that has brought either hurt or frustration or irritation or if it, something's gone on in our relationship, and here's the point, I value you, and I value our relationship, and I don't want to lose that. And so can we have an honest conversation about that and just kind of clarify the issue and seek a solution? So I'm not coming even assuming I'm right, I'm just coming to seek clarity. Like something's gone on, doesn't feel good to me, can we talk about that, all right? So, so the first step is we, it's a, like a mental step that we have to change our paradigm. We're not looking for confrontation, we're looking for clarification. Number two, the second step is we then need to go to the person. And of course, this is what Jesus said, that if you, know, if, if you realize someone's offended, uh, uh, you've been offend, uh, someone's upset with you or that they're, they're, you're upset with them, that we need to go. I remember when I was a young pastor, um, I was part of a denomination, and um, uh, we had an older, kind of wiser 
uh, uh, like a district superintendent, you know, like an older, wiser pastor. He was about the age I am now. But uh, anyway, he, uh, we, when we would meet with him, he would give us this great advice as young pastors. And I remember one of the things that was most helpful, he said, hey, in your churches that when there's going to come up, come, there's going to be people that don't like you, or there's going to be conflict that's going to come up, or there's going to be issues that come up. He's, he says, and as young pastors, you, you're gonna, your, your natural tendency is going to be to run from that and to hide from that and just try to avoid the pastor person or avoid the issue. But he said, that's the worst thing you can do. He said, so, so don't avoid it. Um, don't try to manipulate around it. Um, don't address it from the pulpit. You know, like try to solve a, an issue with one person by teaching on that issue. <laughs> Go to the person directly. And it was some of the best advice that we, we ever received. Um, and so I think that often in our lives that one of the things, there's a lot of reasons we don't want to do this, but one of the, thing, one of the reasons we don't want to go is because we don't know how. And we're afraid, like we don't know what to say, we don't know how to start the conversation, we're afraid that we're just not going to have the skill. And I love what John says again there, uh, John Orberg, he says, uh, go, Jesus says, take action. It's important to remember that when you approach the other person, you may not do it well. You may stutter, you may stammer, you may stumble over your words, but don't let that stop you. Now catch this, it's important to, to try to use as much skill and wisdom as you can. So we're gonna do our best job, we're gonna prepare for this, we're gonna do our very best. But he said, but if you wait until you do it perfectly, you'll never go at all. And so the main thing, uh, so doing it flawlessly is not the main concern. The main thing is to go. So this raises a question, right? So the question is, as followers of Jesus, does this mean that every time I'm upset with someone, every time someone does something that offends me, irritates me, ticks me off, uh, frustrates me, that every time I need to go to them? And the answer is no. Um, that lots of times in the body of Christ, lots of times we can just forgive one another. We can just let things go. We can just overlook it. This is what the Bible means when it says bear with one another. This is what it means when it says um, be patient with one another, forgive one another, be compassionate and kind to give grace as Jesus has forgiven you. So there are many times when in our relationship, a marriage, a family, um, a church, a life group, we can just overlook something and say, hey, you know, maybe not the best, I think that was out, but I'm just going to let it go. And that's fine. But the problem is many times we say that and then we don't let it go. And so sometimes we, this is where pretending comes in. We are pretending we've let it go, but we really haven't let it go. So you say, well, how do I know if I've really let it go? Well, I'm going to give you five tests, all right? So here we go. Number one, brain debates. Um, Y'all know what a brain debate is? It's like when you're in the shower and telling your boss off with what you should have said. It's when you're driving your car and you're thinking through what you are going to say to your wife and you are winning. You are winning big time. <laughs> like if this was, you know, mixed martial arts, she'd be down, she'd be like, boom, you know, on the mat. Like, uh, like a brain debate where you're basically having imaginary conversation with someone in your mind and winning the argument. That is a sign this issue is not done. All right, you've not let it go. A second example is snide or sarcastic remarks. Now, I think that sarcasm can be a great gift. The Apostle Paul used it. Jesus probably used it. I won't put, stake my uh, reputation on him, but uh, Paul for sure. And so, uh, you know, I think uh, I, I love sarcasm. Sarcasm uh, to me is a gift, right? It's, it's a spiritual gift. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in my mind, there's good sarcasm and bad sarcasm, right? And, uh, and, and what you find is that uh, when you have an issue with someone that's unresolved, 
that one way that anger comes out is through snide or sarcastic remarks. Someone talks about them and like, oh, she kind of let me down. It's like, oh, well, that's just Sue, you know. She always does. Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, you know Sue. And it's just that this, uh, this, just, this, this just comes out of us, and it's a sign that it's not resolved. We haven't let it go. A third one is overreaction. When we overreact to a small thing, and so, of course, if you've been married, you know this is a way of life, right? That, that, <laughs> that this, some, your spouse does something that's small, and you react, and like anyone that was there is like, why did you react? It's just a little thing. But it's not just really a little thing, it's the tip of an iceberg of a whole bunch of other things. And so overreaction is often a sign that this is not resolved. And so when you find yourself getting frustrated with this person, uh, angry at this person, you're over to something small, to a sign there's more there that has to be. A fourth sign is talking with others. I mentioned this earlier that, that often when we're upset with someone, we've not, pro- we've not really, it's not resolved we feel a need to talk to others just because it's, it's boiling up inside of us. And we need, so that's a sign. And a fifth sign is withdrawing. When we're just avoiding the person, we don't want to see the person withdrawing from the relationship. And it's like, hey, are you still, are you okay with them? Is that, we're, oh no, we're fine. Yeah, well, why don't you hang out anymore? Uh, oh, you know, life just changed, you know, just busy, whatever. Um, all right, so, so I love the way Wayne Cordero, uh, pastor over at New Hope in Hawaii, puts this. He says, if you're offended, uh, you, have, you have to take the steps to clear it up. That's, it's a non-negotiable. You need to move towards it. He said, but you can either give forgiveness immediately without saying a thing. That's an option. Or you can go to the person, according to Matthew 18, which we kind of looked at this week, but also Matthew 5, like we looked at today, and get it resolved. Either is fine. Either you forgive and let it go, or you get it right. But the third is not an option, which is just to bear a grudge and then let it sit. That's not an option. That's unbiblical. All right? Number, number three. The third step is to seek a solution. And this really deals uh, with our attitude as much as anything, although it gets specific at the end, but it really deals with our attitude. In other words, what, that when we're moving towards someone, we've, we've got the right paradigm now. We're, we're, we're seeking clarification, not confrontation. And we are moving towards them. We've taken the step. We're going to have the meeting. We're going to meet with them. Um, this really deals with our attitude. Why are we going? What do we want to have happen in this meeting? What solution are we looking for? What problem are we trying to solve? But what relationship do we want to preserve? What do we really want? So this is important Like when we go into a conversation like this, let me tell you some goals that we should not have. (laughs) Our goal should not be to vent so we feel better. You know, to get it off my chest. The goal should not be to criticize. I can't believe you did this. The goal is not to accuse. The goal is not to blame. The goal is not to get them to admit that they were wrong. The goal is not to make them pay. You hurt me, and now I'm going to let you have it and let you see how it feels. The goal is to seek a solution, to seek resolution. We want to resolve the issue and preserve the relationship. That's the goal. And so as we go into it, it's important we go in with that mindset. Again, John writes, the question to ask is what do I want? It's an amazing dynamic that when people get to a certain level of anger, their only focus is to win an argument or to inflict pain or get away. They forget to ask the crucial question, what would I like the outcome of the situation to be? What lies in accord with my, with my desires and deepest values? So as we go into this conversation, What is the issue we're trying to resolve? We want to be very specific. This is the issue that I'm trying to resolve. And how do I want our relationship to look when we're done with this conversation? Number four. The fourth step is to share your perspective. So now we're actually there. We've we've got the right uh, mindset. We're moving towards it. We're coming with the right attitude. 
Um, and now it's time to have a conversation. And so how does that conversation go? Well, at some point in the conversation, and there's several different ways, and sometimes this can come up naturally or whatever, but at some point in that conversation, you're need, gonna need to share your perspective, right? You're gonna need to share like, hey, this is what's happened, and this is how I feel about it. So um, sometimes uh, uh, counselors will call this the X, Y, Z approach, right? So you may wanna write that down, X, Y, Z. So let me give you what this, and that they stand for. X stands for the situation, right? X is the situation. Y stands for what happened in the situation. And the Z is how I felt about what happened. Okay? So very simple, X, Y, Z. So, um, so when we go into a conversation like this, we're not looking to go into 18 years of history. Uh, we're not trying, we're, we're trying to be, you know, focused, and we want to, as briefly as possible, and so often, for example, you know, this, the way this conversation can come up can come up a lot of different ways. It's not like one way, but like one way that I'll often do it uh, is especially if I'm working with people that have adopted the, the language of a clarifying conversation. This is where it's very helpful. Uh, that after this language gets released in a, a group, a team, or whatever, and then it becomes very easy to say, hey, can we have a clarifying conversation? And, they, and all of a sudden, they know right away what that means. They know that there's an issue that's come up that you need, want to resolve, but they also know that you're not coming to confront, you're coming to clarify, right? And so if we, it's like it's a great, a great, uh, a great you know, uh, I, I learned this from a friend of mine many years ago, and he was running a business, and he said, yeah, I need to have a, co a clarifying conversation with this person. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? And he explained that, and it was like really super helpful language to me. And so... Uh, so anyway, uh, so in a, sometimes it can happen like that. Uh, if I'm working with someone uh, or having a conversation that's not like that, uh, I'll often just enter and say, hey, can we have an honest conversation about something? And I've never had someone say no. <laughs> like, no, I want to stick to a dishonest conversation. Uh, and so uh, we're going to enter in and just have this. So the, let me illustrate this. So like, let me pick kind of like a hot topic, a uh, hot button topic, Right. Even in Christian circle, it can be a hot button top. Let me pick as an illustration. Let's say that you're a person of color, all right? So you're a person of color, and you're in a life group, and it's a, you know, kind of life group with kind of mixed uh, racial backgrounds, whatever. And, uh, and so a few weeks ago, we had a, a question where we're dealing with favoritism and loving others and stuff. There was a question there about racism, and have you ever experienced racism in your life, right? And so just imagine a life group there. And so you have, listen to this person, let's say it's a white person that says, uh, yeah, I don't know, this question kind of bothered me. It just seems like racism is in the news all the time. By the way, this is a made up story. This is not just like, <laughs> like I'm not talking to that person over there. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it, that it seems like it's in the news all the time. Black Lives Matter, this immigration is coming up all the time. Like, what's the big deal? Can't we just kind of move on? Right? And so they express this. And so you're a person of color there, and you're like deeply offended by that. Because the reality is, you deal with racism every day of your life in a million different ways. And so you decide just to let it go. They're probably just having a bad day. Um, they probably didn't mean it. But you're trying to let it go, just overlook it, but it's just not going away. And you realize it's not, this is not going away. And the Holy Spirit's like, you need to have a conversation. Right? So how would that go? How would the X, Y, Z go? It's like, okay, what's, uh, hey, can we have an honest conversation about something? Yes, all right. So, hey, when we were in life group last week, that's the X situation. And you said this. You said that you, you can't believe this question. It's making a big deal, blah, blah, blah. That's the why. I got to tell you, that was really painful for me. And the reason is, is that I, you know, it may not look like this to you, but I feel as a person of color that I face this like every day of my life in a million ways. And it was really painful for you, for me, just as my brother in Christ, that you would say that. You see how simple it is? X, Y, Z. And so the point is, is that we just like, hey, here's, what, here's, what, here's where it was, here's what happened, here's what was painful. And it's helpful, the more specific we can be 
uh, the better. Now, uh, after we have this, after we share our perspective, the fifth step then is we need to ask for their perspective. And, and so this is just natural, right? So I've just explained that. And, and so I just turn it over to them and say, could you just talk with me about that? Because I value our relationship and I really want to be on good terms. And it was just hard, but I just want to hear from your side of point of view, like maybe what your experience has been or what you meant by that. And so now, if you're the person presenting the issue, that you really know, need to go into a high listening mode. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about empathetic listening, and that when the conversation's logical, you can proceed, but when it's emotional, you need to go back on listening. This is very threatening. Anytime someone comes to you and says, even in like a church setting like this, so if we use the common language of clarity, anytime someone says, can I have an honest conversation or can we have a clarify? It's just, it's natural. Our defenses go up. And we want to make it as easy as possible for our brother or sister. And the way we do that is just by listening and not being reactive. And when they listen, and even if they're defensive, just listen through that and ask questions and kind of go back to that study, that week we study empathetic listening, and we just listen well. And the goal is, is that as they share their heart, then there'll come a time almost like a tennis match for us to share a little bit more, and then for them to share a little bit more. And in, in, a, in, a, in a healthy conversation, this is going back and back, and every time we're going back and forth, it's going deeper. Every time, because every, the more we feel safety, the more we feel like this relationship's okay, that we can have this, it's natural, we're gonna get a little bit more honest, we're gonna share a little bit more truth, there's gonna be a little bit more connection. And the goal then is that as we work through this conversation, that uh, insight would come, that understanding would come, that misunderstandings would be cleared up, that apologies would be made if that's what's appropriate, that other decisions would be made. We'll talk about that in a second. And what I've often found is that steps four and five then are going to alternate with one another. However they start, it's not like I just say this and you say this and, okay, we're done now. It's like I'm going to say this and you're going to say this and I'm going to say this and you're going to say and, and as we share our hearts, and this is where our relationship goes to a whole new level. And I tell you, like on this topic of, you know, racism, this has been an issue for me, just of great growth the last couple of years. And you know how it started? It was with a friend that I have high respect for uh, who's Hispanic, who was sharing with me what it's like to be Hispanic. And I was just blown away. I, I was just so, like, so unaware. And it started this incredible journey for me of this, this whole topic. It's just been a beautiful journey. Um, but it started from him sharing his heart that I wouldn't have known about otherwise. And this situation didn't come out of a conflict situation, but this is what happens in conflict situations is we start sharing hearts. And can you imagine if this, so this white man and this person of color in, in that life group, if they can actually have that conversation? And, and for this, let me tell you what my life is like as a person of color well, really, and can you imagine the level of depth of understanding and love and connection that's going to come because they're able to have that conflict as opposed to I'm dropping out of this life group because that guy's a racist. See, as the body of Christ, we have to be better than this. We have to move towards conflict. We have to listen well. Because it's in the listening that there's life and there's growth and there's healing and there's depth. It's in through conflict that our relationships grow. Now, number six. Number six is to take the next steps. And you say, well, what do you mean? Well, often in a com conflict conversation, you're having this kind of conversation. Sometimes it just gets resolved. There was just a simple misunderstanding. There was more information that comes up and we just resolves it and there's a sense of resolution and peace and that's it, it's over. But often in a conversation like this, there are next steps to be taken. Like, well, what would that look like? Well, sometimes it's like, hey, you've given me a lot to think about 
well, can we give me some time to get away and think and pray, and let's get back together and talk some more. That's the next step. Sometimes there's a step of restitution. Sometimes there's a sense of, wow, I didn't realize I was letting you down and really caused that mess. How can I help to fix that? And there's a step of uh, resolution, of uh, restitution or kind of a fixing. Uh, sometimes, I, I think this often like in a work setting, sometimes it's a like, uh, wow, this happened because we didn't have a good system in place to prevent it from happening. How can we redesign the system so that this doesn't happen again? Uh, sometimes it's just an agreement to disagree. It's like Paul and Barnabas. They, I'm sure they processed it well, but they came to a place where I just feel like we can't take him. He's too big a risk. I feel like we can't. It's denying the gospel. We're not showing grace. And we just agree to disagree. But we, we leave at peace. We may, we may go different ways, but we leave at peace. Uh, a fifth step is to have fun. Conflict often takes its toll on a relationship. And one of the things that we need to do is even we process it well is we just need to have fun together. Hey, let's go see a Dodger game together. Let's do what we normally do. Let's, hey, let's go out as couples. Let's go to a Dodger game. Let's ride motorcycles. Let's do whatever. You know, that we're just going to have some fun together, which just helps restore, kind of repair the equilibrium that's anything that's been taken out. And then number seven. The seventh step is to set realistic expectations. And what I mean by this is that what we're talking about today is the ideal. We're talking about as followers of Jesus, if we love others well, we're going to move towards them in the right way to have a clarifying conversation to resolve things. And that's awesome. And that's what we should always do. But we need to realize that this will not always work. We need to realize there are some people that are, cannot, they're not capable. They don't have the capacity for this kind of conversation. So for example, there's some people in your life you would love to reconcile, they don't want to reconcile. They hate you and they like it that way. <laughs> they feel no need to change. There's not a lot you can do with that. Um, there are some people in your life that if you try to have a conversation with like, it triggers them. Just the fact that you come and say, can we have an honest conversation they may say yes on the outside, but you see their whole body language change. And the moment you begin to bring up, hey, you know, when we were in life group and this, and they just, they can't handle it. Uh, their level of spiritual or emotional maturity is so low. They don't have the capacity. It triggers them. They feel from maybe their past experiences or growing up, they feel attacked. Even if you're not attacked, they feel attacked. They feel like you're projecting things on them. They're not being fair. And what I want you to catch is even if you do it the perfect way, there's many people that can't have this kind of conversation. And so we just need to have realistic expectations. And as followers of Jesus, we always take the high road and do the right thing. But we have to understand that it's not always possible. Like it won't always work. There on your note sheet, I love Romans 12, how practical Paul is. He says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. What a great verse. He says, if it's possible, I mean, this is what we're shooting for. As far as it depends on you, make sure if the relationship's broken, make sure it's not because of your fault. So make it your goal to live at peace, to have shalom with everyone. That's the goal. But you need to understand, and the reason I mention this is because sometimes I've talked to people, counsel people, they try to move towards conflict and it blows up and then they feel bad, like it was their fault. Well, maybe I should have said, maybe if I didn't say this, and sometimes that's the case, but usually it's not. It's not that they didn't handle it perfectly, it's that the other person doesn't have the capacity. And so we just need to understand that hey, we take the high road, but some people can't have this conversation. And so we need to be at peace with one another, with all men, to the extent that it's possible as it depends on us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this, uh, this series, what we're learning, this study, your word, the beauty of your word. And Father, we pray that you'd give us the courage to step with you uh, out into the waves, out into danger when you call, and to move, that you would give us that courage to move towards conflict in the right way. Teach us, train us, shepherd us. And as we bring our gifts, our tithes, our offerings, may you meet us in a powerful way as we worship you now 
and we sing about your, your calling on our lives to help us to be brave. And we pray it in your name, amen. Would you stand with me?